Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inshallah, today we are starting from verse number 15 of Surah Al Mulk. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wa kafa wa salamu ala ibadihin ladhi nustafa, khususan ala Sayyidi Rusli wa Khatim al Anbiya, wa ala alihi laskiya wa ashabihi latqiya amma ba'd. فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور أأمنتم من في السماء أن يخسف بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن يرسل عليكم حاصبا فستعلمون كيف نذير ولقد كذب الذين من قبلهم فكيف كان نكير أولم يروا إلى الطير فوقهم صافات ويقبض ما يمسكهن إلا الرحمن إنه بكل شيء بصير أمن هذا الذي هو جند لكم ينصركم من دون الرحمن إن الكافرون إلا في غرور أمن هذا الذي يرزقكم إن أمسك رزقه بل لجوا في عتو ونفور أفمن يمشي مكبا على وجهه أهدى أمن يمشي سويا على صراط مستقيم قل هو الذي أنشأكم وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون قل هو الذي ذرأكم في الأرض وإليه تحشرون ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين قل إنما العلم عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين فلما رأوه زلفة سيئت وجوه الذين كفروا وقيل هذا الذي كنتم به تدعون قل أرأيتم إن أهلكني الله ومن معي أو رحمنا فمن يجير الكافرين من عذاب أليم قل هو الرحمن آمنا به وعليه توكلنا فستعلمون من هو في ظلال مبين قل أرأيتم إن أصبح ماءكم غورا فمن يأتيكم بماء معي صدق الله عنه. Last week الحمد لله we covered the first 14 verses of Surah Al-Mulk and we covered some of the virtues of Surah Al-Mulk as well. The most common from them, the most famous from them, being that the one who recites Surah Mulk every day, this Surah Mulk will intercede on behalf of this person on the Day of Judgment. In another narration, as we narrated last week, the Prophet says, whoever recites Surah Mulk every day after Isha Salah, that person will be protected from the punishment of the grave. Now one of the reasons why these virtues are there regarding this person being interceded on behalf of on the Day of Judgment and this individual being protected from the punishment of Allah in the grave is because the one who reads Surah Mulk with its meaning will always be afraid of the punishment of Allah and he will constantly ask Allah for protection from it. Because in Surah Mulk, Allah first talks about His kingdom. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about His power, His ability to do things. And then Allah after that, He warns us of those who get it wrong, the people who don't take heed from this, this lesson that's being mentioned in Surah Mulk, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us of their punishment. And then after that, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala then talks about His power once again, how capable Allah Azza wa Jal is of doing things. And then at the end, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says that if Allah Azza wa Jal abandons you, there is no one that can help you. So after reading this surah, and imagine reading this every single day with its meaning, what kind of profound impact it will have on a person. Right? And this is the, the virtues, if you ever look at the virtues that the Prophet SallAllahu gives for a particular surah, the virtue isn't just because it's there. It's because that message of the surah is for that thing. For example, the one who reads Surah Kahf, what's the virtue for that? Be protected from the job. Very common, right? You read Surah Kahf every Friday, you will be protected from the job. But why? What does Surah Kahf have to offer that saves a person from the job? It's a question, right? Why this surah? Why not Surah Ikhlas? Or let's make it harder and say Surah Baqarah. Why Surah Kahf? The reason is because the message in Surah Kahf is exactly that. Materialism, whole, material things have no value in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you can read Surah Kahf with its meaning, how these young men who didn't rely on the materialistic values that the king was offering them and they relied on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then how Musa alayhi salam, he thought his knowledge was something, but Allah Azza says that your knowledge is one thing that's maybe materialistic, it's something that's tangible, if anything. But the knowledge that Allah Azza has, that he shares with certain servants, it's beyond boundaries. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of, a, of, 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 the, of the wealth, that the people they thought that their wealth was going to save them. But then Allah Azza says, 
that Allah Azza wa Jalla قَالَ لَهُ الصَّاحِبُ هُوَ وَيُحَاوِرُ أَكَفَرْتَ بِالَّذِي خَلَقَكَ مِنْ تُرَابٍ Allah Azza wa Jalla gave him so much wealth, he held his intentions from spending in the path of Allah, he lost all of it. So never be materialistic, because this will be the nature of the Jal's attack. He will show people materialistic things. I will give you my Jannah. I will give you this wealth. I will give you that. He will be so materialistic. But then Allah Azza wa says, the one who reads Surah Kahf will learn that lesson that materialism means nothing at all. What matters is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. That's why a person who stands in front of the Jal, if he reads Surah Kahf every week, he would have learned that lesson by now. And when he stands in front of the Jal, he'll say, I learned that lesson by reading that Surah every Friday. Trust me, it's not going to work. You can offer whatever you want to. I have no interest at all because I will stand for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do. There's a very famous scholar by the name of Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi rahimahullah ta'ala. He wrote a commentary on, on this Surah Kahf. And this was the whole theme of it. I can't remember the word, the, the translation, the name of the, the translation. Uh, it's actually in English too. If you search online, you can maybe find it. Um, if you search online, you can find it. Uh, Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi rahmatullahi alayhi tafsir of Surah Kahf. I highly encourage every person to get a hold of that and read it. It's not too big and you will learn so much from it. He really goes into a lot of detail. So Khair, coming back to Surah Mulk right here. So keep in mind that in Surah Mulk, we are talking about some very important things here. The theme of Surah Mulk roams around two things. If you look at all of these ayat in Surah Mulk, they, the theme roams around two things. What are the two things? The first thing Allah Azza wa Jal establishes His Mulk. And the second thing Allah Azza wa Jal establishes His Qudra. These two things are very clearly stated in Surah Mulk. These are the two things. If I can tell you two things to walk away from Surah Mulk with, what are the two words? The first is Mulk and the second is Qudra. The mulk of Allah, meaning the kingdom of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal has kingdom over everything. If the president can flash his you know, Air Force One and try to prove that he has a lot of you know, wealth, or flash the White House and show that he has a lot of wealth, or flash you know, whatever it is that they have, these, these barricades and these limousines and these suits and you know, the paparazzi and, 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 and the media team, if these things impress you and I because this person has it and we can never imagine having it, imagine the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where the Prophet وسلم, tells us that every day 70,000 angels are created. How many? Imagine the biggest football stadium that you can think of. That many seats. And every one of them is not a filthy scumbag human being. But they are angels. And their mission in life is to do tawaf around the house of Allah once. And after they have done tawaf once, they go in front of the arsh of Allah and they do sajda and they will remain there until the day of judgment. They will never get a second chance again. Then another group will come the next day. And another group will come the next day. And another group, can you imagine the flow of angels in front of the throne of Allah doing sajda there? That's what you call kingdom. This is what you call kingdom, where you can't even imagine the flow of angels, how far they are. That's what Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُو The only one who knows of the true kingdom, the true army of Allah is Allah Himself. No one else can even imagine the power of Allah, the kingdom of Allah. So that's the first thing, the mulk. <laughs> this is the first thing we have to understand. That's why Allah Azza wa Jalla starts the surah by saying, in the hand of Allah lies all kingdom. Whatever Allah Azza wa Jal wants happens. Whatever He does not want can never happen. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sitting with his cousin Ibn Abbas radiAllahu Anhu, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiAllahu Anhu, and they were sitting on the animal together. And when they were sitting on the animal together, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, "I will give you some advice. Bear this advice in mind; it'll be very helpful to you. And this advice is very important for the youth." It's because the Prophet ﷺ was giving this advice to a young man. And Ibn Abbas was, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ passes away, the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari where he says, I just about, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, I just about hit the age of puberty then. Okay, he's, he narrates thousands of hadith, and how many, when the Prophet ﷺ passes away, what is he doing? He's just hitting the age of puberty. What's that? 12, 13 years old? 10, 11, 12, 13, the scholars, they say, somewhere there because he says himself, I hit the age of puberty at that time. So how young was he? And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, let me give you some advice. He's a young man, and the Prophet ﷺ is giving him advice. And what is he saying to him? In this hadith is in Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi's 40 collection. In the collection of 40 hadith, it's in there. And in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells him, you know, um, oh, oh, oh young man, ihfadillah, be mindful of Allah. Right? Tajidhu tujahak, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking care of you. And the Prophet ﷺ says to him, wa idha sa'alta fas'alillah, that when you ask, who do you ask from? Only ask Allah. And when you need help, he says to this young man, because he knows young people, they have the habit of asking. You know, we're weak, and we realize that we need help all the time. And as human beings, we always are. But as a young man in particular, young children, they always have this need to ask. They always need help. So he's saying to him that when you do ask, who do you ask from first? 
First ask Allah. When you need help, who do you ask first? You said, ask Allah for first. Ask Allah first. And why is that? Wa'alam. أن الأمة لو اجتمعوا على أن ينفعوك بشيء لم ينفعوك إلا ما كتب الله لك. He says the reason is because if you ask everyone in the world for help and they try to help you, but that one thing that they are trying to give you, Allah has ordained you should never get it. It's impossible you can have that. And then he says the opposite of that. أن الأمة لو اجتمعوا على أن يضروك بشيء and if you ask the world not to harm you, you say don't don't harm me, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me. And the entire ummah gathers together to harm you. They can never harm you unless Allah Azawajal has allowed them to do so. So who should you ask for first? There's no point asking, you know, the, the doorkeeper to let you in. Just get permission from the imam in the masjid. Get, get, get permission from the person whose house that is. Ask the host, the person who owns the house, let me in. If he says you in, let, let you in, what's that doorkeeper going to do? He can't do anything. He can't stop it. The doorkeeper, all he does is open the door. He closes the door. But the orders come from who? The one above. Allah Azawajal is teaching us the very same thing. The people around you, they're like doorkeepers. What value do they have? What value does the doorkeeper have? Does anyone salute the doorkeeper like he salutes you know, Bill Gates? No, the doorkeeper is just a doorkeeper. That's how people are. People are doorkeepers. If they open the door for you, say thank you to them. Thank you very much. But at the end of the day, there's no need to go all wild and say, oh man, you know, you're the best person. Let's just have the meeting here. Forget that person there. <laughs> so this is how we are. We forget to realize and acknowledge that Allah Azawajal is the one who has the, the ability to change things. That's why we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is musabbib al-asba. Allah azawajal is the one who creates the means. And we should never lose our focus on who is the one who's giving the means. Allah azawajal is the ultimate, the powerful. The barakalladhi biyadihil mulk. The kingdom lies in the hands of Allah. And the second point that we learn from Surah Mulk, which is very important, is that Allah azawajal has the ability to do whatever He wishes. There is no one that can stop Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He orders the earth, it will swallow us in. Allah azawajal orders the sky, Stones will fall and will be gone. Allah Azza wa Jalla orders the birds, they stand up. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells them to come down, they come down. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, whatever He orders, that's what's going to happen. If Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wishes for me to wake up tomorrow without eyesight, there's no one in the world who could stop that from happening. If Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wishes for our death to be tomorrow, the whole world can gather together, but they cannot stop it. If you have been, if the if the if the taqdeer has been set that you will get this job, you're going to get it. If Allah Azza wa Jalla has said that you will get this much money. You're going to get it regardless. The very famous story of Ali radiallahu anhu. My teacher used to always tell us a story. That Ali radiallahu anhu, when he was tra- once he was traveling, and while he was traveling, he passed by this little area, this place. And when he saw this place, he remembered that this was a place the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once upon a time, stopped there and prayed to Rakah. So in memory of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu had passed away by now. He said, let me stop here and also pray to Rakah. So when he pulled over, he pulled his horse over on the side, and he got off his horse. He couldn't find a place to his horse, so he saw, he saw one person there. And he said to this person, my dear friend, can you please wash my horse? I'm just going to do wudu, pray to Raqqa, and I'll be back. That person said, okay, I'll watch it. So he took Ali radiallahu anh's horse, Ali radiallahu anh. He did wudu, he prayed to Raqqa, and after to Raqqa, the salah was over, he thought to himself, man, the guy did such a big favor for me, let me give him a little gift. So he went in his pocket, he reached inside, he pulled out 10 dirham. Now when he came outside, he saw the horse was there, that guy was missing, and his saddle was gone. The guy stole his saddle and ran away. Ali the Allah was looking around thinking, man, I was going to give the guy a gift and he ran away with my saddle. Now what? So he held his horse by the side. He took him to the market. He was looking for a store to buy a saddle from. He found the store there. He went to that store. He said, I need a saddle. What kind of saddle? What's your measurements? What kind of material are you looking for? So he described his saddle. The guy said, oh, I have one saddle that matches the requirements. Some guy just sold it to me right now. And he picked it up and he bought it to me. This one right here. And Ali the Allah said, that's my saddle. He said, well, that guy sold it to me. If you want to buy it, you're going to have to pay me for it. So he said to him, how much did you, how much did you give him for that saddle? He said, 10 dirham. Ali radiallahu anh said, subhanAllah. It was in his taqdeer to get that 10 dirham, but it was his choice whether he took it from the halal way or whether he took it as a sadaqah or a gift from Ali radiallahu anh. Whether he was going to get that $10, that 10 dirham as a gift from the Amirul Mu'mineen was his choice, or whether that 10 dirham was going to be his cause to be punished by Allah on the Day of Judgment, that was his choice. Whatever Allah Azza wa Jalla has written, it will happen. And there's nothing that can be done about that. Nothing at all that can be done about that. So the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the mulk, the kingdom of Allah. When a person has these two things in mind, we learn how to submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you know the person in front of you has the ability, when you know the person in front of you has the power, then you don't stand up to that person. You understand? You submit. Whether that's in a, in, in, in a soccer game, 
The guy in front of you has the ability to rock you. He has the power. You know, you say you forfeit. You say, you know what? I raise the right flag. I, I forfeit. You're in a battlefield. You see the guy in front of you has the ability. He has so much, you know, so much artillery there. They have the power. They have the manpower. You say, you know what? I forfeit. The guy's in front of you, on top of you. He has you in an arm bar. He's yanking your arm off. You realize he has the ability to pull this joint out, and he also has the power. Let me just tap and forfeit. So you have to realize that you have to forfeit or submit yourself. In better words, submit yourself to Allah. Because Allah Azawajal has both things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the mulk, he has the control, and Allah Azawajal also has the power. He has the qudra to do so. He has both things there. So this is what the theme of Surah Mulk is. So the verse that we start from today, verse number 15. A lot of, this, a lot of these ayat are self-explanatory. They explain themselves. There's nothing much to say about them. They're very clear. Because Allah Azawajal's qudra, his power is also very clear. Allah Azawajal's kingdom is also very clear. There's not really much that a person can say. So in verse number 15, Allah Azawajal says, He is the one who created the earth. Valulan, tame, controlled. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have the earth controlled, what would happen to us? We'd fall, we'd slip, we'd be sucked inside, we'd tip over, we'd break bones, break, break, bones, break joints. That happens, right? You know, there's a little earthquake, small earthquake. And some guy, he cracks his, uh, cracks his ankle. A little slip over, a small earthquake, and what happens? He dislocated his ankle. Imagine the earth was shaking full control, full power. What would happen to us? Forget about you know, a little crack in the ankle or a little dislocated joint. Bones would break. We'd break into pieces within moments. We'd be gone. Do you understand? That's why when we go on a roller coaster, we make sure we're strapped in a million times. Because we know that if we lose that safety for a second, this here has no ability to bear that pain. And we're going to be in a lot of trouble. We tie our seatbelts on and we make sure that we're safe and secure. So we're so thankful. Allah Azawajal says, be thankful. Allah Azawajal is the one who created the earth. Dhalul. Dhalul is a very interesting word because I translated it as being tamed. But in reality, the word dhalul, it comes from another root word, which is dhilla. And dhilla means to be disgraced, as opposed to izza. You guys understand? <coughs> izza, what does izza mean? To be honored. And what does dhilla mean? To disgrace. To be, to be dishonored. When a person's dishonored or when he's disgraced, what happens is you kind of have him in control. You lower that person down. As opposed to a person who's respectful, he's kind of more in control of himself. When a person is disrespectful, dis not in a negative way, but in the sense that he doesn't have that honor that the, the, the honored person has, he's more in control. This is a good way to know whether you have any izzah or not. Whether you're in control of yourself or other people are in control of you. If you feel that other people around you are in control of you, then you don't have izzah. You don't have any izzah at all. Right? But if you are in control of yourself, that means you have honor, you have izzah. The only person that a person should lower themselves in front of is Allah and the Rasul and the Deen. That's where a person lowers himself in front of these things and he doesn't stick himself up, he, he, he lowers himself down. So Allah Azza wa Jal, when he describes earth, he describes it like a person who has that lack of honor because the one who has a lack of honor, he has lack of honor in compared to someone who has honor. You understand? If I say you do not have honor in compared to this person, but in compared to this person, you have honor. Does that make sense to you? So Allah Azza wa is saying, we created the earth tamed with lack of honor in comparison to the one who walks on it. The one who walks on it, meaning this human being, Allah Azza wa says, we gave this human being honor. And that's also a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah Azza wa gave us this honor. Otherwise, in reality, we do not deserve this honor. And then Allah subhanahu another point from here, that Allah Azza wa says, we created the earth for you, tamed. And a side point here to keep in mind, that when Allah Azza wa says we created the earth for you, tamed, we are also a part of that earth. Right or wrong? Yes or no? We, Allah Azza wa says, I created the earth for you, tamed, controlled. But aren't we a part of that earth? And we're untamed? Do you understand the point that's being made here? Allah Azza wa says, I created the earth for you, tamed and controlled. You are a part of that earth, but you're untamed. How did that happen? Aren't you supposed to learn a lesson from the earth underneath you? That the earth is submitted to Allah, the earth is, you know, tamed and controlled. I, as a human being, should also be tamed and controlled. Because Allah Azawajal tells us in the Quran, Minha khalaqnakum. From this earth we created you. Every single human being was created from this earth. That's why the Prophet said, Annasu min Adam wal Adam min Turab. Every human being is from Adam alayhi salam. And Adam alayhi salam, where is he from? He's from soil. That's where that's the clay. Allah Adam alayhi salam was created from clay. And the Prophet sends this hadith. He says this hadith in the context of pride. That there's no need to be proud of yourselves. Every human being is from Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam is from soil. That's your origin. Calm. Take it easy. It's over. Same thing here. Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us in one verse of the Quran. Minha khalaqnakum. That from this earth we created you. And into this earth we will return you. 
Just as you came out of it, you're going to have to return back there too. وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ دَارَةً أُخْرَىٰ And then one more time, we will take you out of the earth, and then you won't go back in there again. You came from the earth, you will return to the earth. And after you go to the earth, we're going to take you back out one more time. But when we take you out that next, the last time, are you going to go back to that earth again? Then it's done. Then you're done. Now either you go to the fire of hell, or either you go to paradise, based on your action, that's where your abode will be. So, and, and based off this ayah right here, my teacher used to always say something. Actually, the Mufassirin mentioned this. That the earth a person is created from, the part of the land, the part of the earth that a person was created from, the part of soil that was used in a human being's creation, well, a person can know which part that was when he dies. Because Allah Azza wa says, from it we created you, and to it we will return you. So the scholar says, when a person dies in a place, the place he dies in is a sign that that was a soil used for his creation. He was... You know, if he dies in Chicago, for example, that's where he's buried. That was a soil used for his creation. That's why they prefer that a Muslim should be buried in a Muslim graveyard along with other Muslims. So that just to take that, 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 that the holding there that we were created from a good soil. That's why the scholars they always make dua that Oh Allah, give us death where in Medina Manawara in Makkah Mukarrama, because we hope that that's where the soil was used from when we were created. And my teacher used to add upon this, and this is where he used to say, he used to say, imagine. How lucky that person will be because the Prophet ﷺ says, right? The hadith is there. One day the Prophet ﷺ entered into the masjid. And when he came in the masjid in his right hand, he was holding Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu's hand. And the left hand he had Umar radiallahu's hand, and they walked into the masjid together. And the sahaba saying when they walked in, we all looked at them. And it was like a super thing, like the like the all-star team. That was an all-star team there. Can you imagine that? The Prophet ﷺ, on the right hand he has. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh, on the left hand he has Umar radiallahu anh. Imagine that. Imagine three people you respect a lot. And the three of them holding hands and walking together. This is like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh, and Umar, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anh. It just doesn't get any better than that. And the three of them hold hands and they walk in together. And the Sahaba said that when we saw them, we thought, SubhanAllah, look how beautiful they look. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that we are together in this world and we will be together like this on the Day of Judgment too. And the scholars, they say from there, my teacher used to add these two points together. He used to say that it seems that they were all created from the same soil. Because when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, right next to him, who was buried? Abu Bakr Siddiq. And right next to him, who was buried? Umar bin Khattab. It seems as if they were all created from that very same pure and clean soil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also give us the ability to be buried in that soil. But this soil has lessons for us. And one of the lessons that we learn from the soil that we walk on is that not all soil is beneficial. Not all human beings are good. Some soil is barren. It, it can't give you anything. Some soil is very fertile. Some people, they just, they're a waste of space on the earth, for lack of better words. And for some people, they're so productive. They do so much. Have you seen that? You see someone, you know, I saw one of my teachers. He was such a young man, and he had achieved so much in life. And I thought to myself, subhanAllah, if I live 10 lives like him, I probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to achieve what this guy's achieved. There were scholars like this. Sheikh Ashraf Ali Thani, a prominent example. The man had written over a thousand books. And each of those books, it wasn't like, you know, something so like cheaply and badly written. Like, you know how nowadays the college kids write their, write their exam papers? If you read those papers that most of the kids write in college, they're so terrible that you think to yourself that maybe the teacher was, you know, in his sleep when he passed this guy in his exam. It's so poorly written. Grammar is terrible. Content is terrible. Pure copy and paste. And you know, there's no value to this article written here at all. Sheikh Ashraf Ali Thani, at his time, there was no copy and paste. Do you understand? He didn't have that control C, control V button. Do you understand? <laughs> what he wrote was original. And it was so powerful. He was so, so great and so wise in his writings. That, SubhanAllah, sometimes when you read his books, many times when I read a Sheikh Ashraf Ali Thani's works, I read it once, I read it twice, I read it three times, and then I understand it. Even for this tafsir class, before I deliver this tafsir class, there's one tafsir that I read through. It's written by Mawlana Shafi Tani, Ashraf al-Tafasir. And every time that I read it, I read the page. Usually if I'm reading a tafsir book, I can talk to someone and read at the same time. Ibn Kathir, or others, you can easily, you know, you can multitask because it's not so hard. But Sheikh Ashraf al-Tani's books, I have to tell the brother that's sitting in front of me, give me two minutes. I have to read this. I'll read it once. I'll read it twice, I'll read it thrice, and then I feel that I'm, now I'm catching on to what he's actually trying to say. And how many books did he write like this? Over a thousand books the man wrote. He literally wrote over, if you go to, there are actually full bookstores in India, and full publishing houses, the only thing they publish are his books. 
That's all they publish because there's so many books to publish. They, they, just, they just keep reprinting those things again and again, again and again. There are some people, when you look at their lives, Sheikh Abdul Hay, Al Laknawi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he passed away at the age of 40. How old was he? Before 40. He passed away before 40, if I'm correct. And he had written over 100 books. And his books are so powerful. They say that if you calculate the days from his birth until his death and divide the pages that he wrote during his lifetime, it works out to be roughly 13 to 14 pages per day. How many? That's if you calculate from which day? From the day he was born until the day he died. You calculate all those, it works out to be 13 to 14 pages per day. Right? And, 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 and Wallahu Alam, but they say that he died from khushk zahni. His brain went dry, they say. <laughs> Wallahu Alam, how that works, but they say he overused the CPU and it burnt out. The motherboard just, it just burnt out. He, he, he was so into it. He, they, were, they were scholars. When you look at their lives, you think to yourself that, how did these guys write this kind of stuff? How are they, what were they doing? And then there were those of our, the people like us who literally completely waste every second of our lives. Honestly, when I look back at my life, and people, I'm sure every person sitting here can say this, that when I look back at my life, I think to myself, what a waste, man. I could have done so many more things in a better way and achieved more in that period of time. So this is how soil is. I'm going off this first, 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 first part of this ayah. That in the earth, there are those parts of the earth that are beneficial. And then there are those parts that are, they're, 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 they're very fertile. And then in the earth, you have those parts that are very stingy, very, very uh, what do you call the quicksand. Wants everything that comes to, wants to pull it inside. And then those parts of the earth that they don't want anything, they'll throw it out like lava. They'll spit it out. They don't want anything. They want it to come out of it. Do you understand? So there are those people who are very tight. And then there are those people who will give. And then what comes out of the earth, not everything is beneficial. Like I said, lava, some of it that comes out is very harmful. And some things that come out, they're very beneficial. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the earth in itself, if you look at it, the, the color of the earth, the soil color, there's different colors within the earth. There's dark earth, there's brown earth, there's lighter earth. But do these, do these, do these grains of earth hate each other? Where did racism come from in mankind then? We're from this earth. Do you understand? We have different colors. Why do we hate each other? The earth doesn't hate that. It's not like the earth that, you know, in my backyard says, you know what, I don't want to go to the desert. I don't like that brown guy. Do you understand? It, it doesn't happen. It's like, you know, they're, they're with one another. It's just, it's common sense. So Allah Azza wa Jal here, He says, Allah Azza wa made for you the earth, which is tamed. And the point that I started from was that if the earth is tamed, we are created from the earth, shouldn't we also be tamed? Allah says, so walk amongst its slopes. Allah created it, so walk in the earth. And eat from his provision. Who does the provision belong to? Every time you break an apple off a tree, every time you break a banana off and you bite, what should you think? Who gave you this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time you break it off, you say, Allah, thank you. This is, this is Allah Azza wa Jal's. Had it not been for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's impossible for us to have it. But ilayhin nushur, and to him is resurrection. Do you feel secure that he who holds authority in the heaven would cause the earth, right? And yaqsifa bikum al-ard. The cause the earth to swallow you, and suddenly you would you would you would be away, you would be gone. You would sway. You'd be gone. Allah Zabajal says, Do you have any sort of security, any sort of guarantee that your actions won't cause Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to order the earth to suck you inside? Had this not happened before? Has this happened before? It has happened. The history has seen this. That Qarun and his wealth, what happened to them? Swallowed them. They were gone. No sign of him anymore. Allah says there's no sign of Qarun anymore. So when you sin, when you and I disobey, doesn't that thought cross our mind? What guarantee do we have? Do we have some kind of certificate saying that Allah is not going to order the earth to swallow me? That's what the ayah says. Amintum, do you have security? Do you have security on this? That Allah won't, earth, won't order the earth to suck you inside? And if he does, you would sway away. You'd be gone. You and I would be gone. We'd have no stance at all. Verse number 17. السَّمَاءِ The Qudra of Allah. You know how I was talking about the ability? The Qudra? These ayat are here. السَّمَاءِ Do you feel secure that he who holds authority in the heaven would not send against you a storm of stones? Has history not seen that before? Of course we have. We, history has seen that a storm came with stones and they wiped the entire nation out. The entire nation was gone. This is more or less what happened to them. A wind came with stones. The earth was lifted. The, the stones came down and pelted them. The earth was turned upside down like a fat pancake. And right down inside, there was no sign of them anymore. When the land was excavated, that's when they found their bodies. Otherwise, there was no even sign of them. Allah says, what guarantee do you and I have from this? Then, 
you would know how severe my warning was. If Allah's punishment does come, then you're going to realize how serious it is. Right? And, but until the punishment doesn't come, we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's kind of like, you know, a father tells his son, don't, don't speak when adults are talking. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. The son talks. The son, don't talk when adults are talking. You're going to be in trouble. He does this a few times until the father slaps him on the face. The kid's crying now. Oh my God. His father was warning him all this time. Don't do it. Don't do it. And at the end, what happens? This father, the son says, Dad, you're oppressive. His father wasn't oppressive. Who was the wrong one here? It's the son that was wrong. This is how we react. Allah says, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this in the Quran. Again, don't do this. Don't do this. If you do this, you're going to get the punishment of Allah. Warning and warning and warning. And at the end of it, we still do wrong. And then we say, oh Allah, look how oppressing you are. You're going to punish people on the hereafter. I thought you were merciful. Do you see how, how crooked our thinking is? Do you see how crooked our thinking is? You have so many speed limit signs. 55, 55, you know, 294, do not drive over 55 miles an hour. And then you have a guy who's driving some broken stick shift car, right, that's just about in two pieces and he's driving 80 miles an hour. The clutch is burnt out too. And while he's driving his car at 80 miles an hour, the cop, the cop pulls him over and he says to him, what were you doing? He says, oh, I was speeding a little. Didn't you see the signs? Yes, he's still going to give him the ticket, right? Are you going to call the, uh, the cop an oppressor? No. It's a guy who's driving that broken car, driving it that fast, putting his life at danger. Who was the oppressor? So we have to keep this in mind. Allah Azawajal says, this is my power here. And if you don't learn, very soon you will know of the warnings. The warnings that came before, then you're going to regret it. You are not the first people to reject. Indeed, those who came before, they also rejected. So how terrible was my approach? Sorry. So how terrible was the approach? How scary is what happened to them? Look, look at the past. Look at people who disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what happened to them. Learn your history. Until you don't know your history, you won't know anything. I'm telling you, I tell my friends this all the time. That learn Islamic history. Look what happened to nations before. Look how Muslims had such great kingdoms. What happened to all of it? Where did they go wrong? How did the Ottoman Empire fall? Stop blaming the French in the West for attacking them. Think about what we were doing. Look at ourselves. How did the Ottoman Empire collapse? How did the Abbasid Empire collapse? How did Muslims in Spain actually collapse? It wasn't like all of a sudden everything just changed. The Muslims in Spain did something. What happened? Does anyone know what they did? They divided their country into pieces. They didn't stand united. When Spain was one big community, when Muslims were together, that's when there was no one in the world who could come to them. It didn't matter how big the army came. They couldn't take them out. But when the Muslims in Spain decided, you know what? You know, your kingdom is there, my kingdom is here. And they broke off into so many, these, uh, these, these, so many small little, you can say, countries for the better of your... What are you saying? Yeah, the, the, the Salatin, they say, they call, they call the, the smaller kingdoms that came. All these smaller kingdoms that came in, that's when they were hit in the head. They fought each other. They fought each other back and forth. And I say this all the time, man. What happened to Spain 700, 800 years ago is exactly what's happening to the Middle East right now. It was one big country. Now what happened? You spit and you're already in Amman. Do you understand? You know, you throw a stone and you're in Libya. What happened? How did one strong nation break into so many pieces? And we think, oh, that's not going to happen again. It is happening again. History repeats itself. History always repeats itself. So what we need to do, look at the people before us who came. Look at their mistakes. And we look at their mistakes, that's going to help you realize that if I made the mistake that if I make the mistake they made, I'm going to have the same problem right here. If I don't make that mistake, I'm going to be successful. That's why Allah Azza He gives us stories of people of the past. Otherwise, that's backbiting. The story of Firaun is pure backbiting in the Quran if we don't learn a lesson from it. You can't just sit there and say Firaun was smack, Firaun was this, that's backbiting. You can't backbite him like that. You can only mention Firaun's name in a negative connotation if, if what? If you're taking a lesson from there. You can't just make fun of Qarun, Qarun was whack. You can't say that. You can only use Qarun's name in a negative connotation if you're taking a lesson from that. You can't sit there, oh, Malut or any of these nations, you can't make fun of them. Otherwise, that's pure backbiting. Unless you are taking a lesson from their life. Allah says here, learn a lesson. Do they not see the birds above them with wings outspread and sometimes folded in? None holds them aloft, high except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, He is of all things seeing. Right? Allah sees everything. So when you look at the birds above you, you know how they travel in groups together? And everyone's just in sync. They make that perfect shape and all have their wings out. Everything's so perfect. Allah says, they're that high in that perfect structure because we allowed them to be. Otherwise, they couldn't stand there. Think about it. The wind's blowing so heavily. 
Planes can't even take it. They start shaking. And how does a bird do it? It's so weak. Does it have aluminum? Does it have a big, you know, front part, big wings, big engines? Nothing. It's just a small, weak bird. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's weak bird is way stronger than our concords. Because a concords couldn't make it to that sky that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has birds flying in without any problem at all. This is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're still talking about the Qudra. I said to you guys, Surah Mulk can be summarized in two words. What were the two words? Mulk and Qudra. Mulk means the kingdom of Allah. The Qudra means the ability, the power of Allah. So now we're still continuing on with the Qudra. Or who is it that could be an army for you to aid you rather than the most merciful? Who is there that can help you other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In al kafirun illa fi ghurur, the disbelievers are not but in delusion. Amman hadha alladhi yarzukukum in amsaka rizqa. Or who is it that can provide for you if he withheld his provisions? Balladju fi utu wa nufur. But they have persisted in utu. Utu means in transgression. Nufur means in nafra, in hatred. They have, they, have trans, they have persisted in their transgression and their hatred. Afamay yamshi mukibban ala wajhihi ahda. Then. Is the one who has fallen, who walks while fallen on his face, better guided than the one who walks erect and on the straight path? If a man is on the ground and he's walking with his face down, and a man is standing up straight with his face up, who can walk more straight? The one that's looking, obviously, he can see what's happening, right? Allah Azza says, the kuffar, they are walking with their faces down. Their vision is too narrow, they're looking down. While Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, everything it says, it's making you look far. You're seeing far, you're not going off... Short-term results, you're going off long-term results. You're making a real investment. <coughs> Say, it is he who has produced you and made for you hearing and vision and hearts, meaning hearts, meaning intellect. Little are you grateful. Allah Azawajal gave us all these body parts. We still don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said every morning, when you wake up, you should make one sadaqah on behalf of every joint in your body. And how do you make one sadaqah on behalf of every joint in your body? Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah, make dhikr of Allah. Right? Make dhikr of Allah. In some narrations, how many times should you do, how many joints in the body do you have? 360. So how many times should you do dhikr every day? At least 360 times, say something. Just so you can give sadaqah. Say, say thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on behalf of every joint in your body. Say, it is he who has multiplied you throughout the earth, and to him you will be gathered. And they say, when is this promise if you should be truthful? The kuffar, what would they say? After hearing all of this of Surah Mulk, you know, this whole detail that Allah can suck you in the sky, the winds can blow you out, the last week's verses, how the earth, how the fire of hell, it, it boils. You remember how I explained to you guys how it boils? I gave you guys the analogy of an atomic bomb or a C4 explosion. You know, first one big cloud comes and then the second big cloud comes and you have, and these clouds are not smoke clouds, we're talking about fire. Big round fireballs. Have you ever seen that before on TV or somewhere where they show you an explosion of a C4 explosion? One big fireball, second big fireball, and it comes out. So that's how the fire of hell will be. Allah in the, the verse that we recited last week. What was the ayah? Oh yeah, here. تفور, it's going to be boiling. The fire of hell is going to be boiling in flames. So when they hear of all this punishment of Allah, the kuffar, rather than saying, okay, Allah, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. I apologize for everything I did in the past. What are the kuffar? What's their response? Ayah number 25 is their response. Okay, okay. Stop talking. Bring the punishment. We're waiting for it. What did they say? They say, when is this promise? In kundum sadiqin, should you be truthful? When is, this, when is the punishment of Allah coming? Come on, bring it fast. If you, what you're saying is true, bring it now. Allah Azza wa Jal answers that himself. He says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ The knowledge belongs to Allah. Allah knows when the final hour will be. Allah knows when the punishment will come. وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ I am only a clear warner. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُمْ زُلْفَةً سِيَتْ وُجُوهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا But when they see it approaching, when they see the fire of Allah approaching on the day of judgment, when they're there. And they see that fire running in their direction and, and jumping at them. Siat wujuhilladina kafaru. The faces of those who disbelieve will be bad. Siat, they'll become bad. You know how when a person is scared, you know how they make a scary face? 
If someone catches that on camera, the last thing you want is you to be tagged on that picture on Facebook. Because it's so scary. Okay? Allah says, when they see the fire coming their way, their faces are going to go bad. They're going to be distorted. They're going to be so scared. They're going to make a terrified face. See at wujuh ladhina kafaru. Waqeel, and it will be said, هَذَا الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ بِهِ تَدَّعُونَ This is that for which you used to call. You know how you used to make claims calling on Allah, where's your punishment? Allah says, here it is. It's here now. You wanted it? قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنْ يَاللَّهِ Verse number 28. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنْ يَاللَّهِ Say, O Muhammad, have you considered whether Allah should cause my death or those with me or have mercy on us? Who can protect the disbelievers from a painful punishment? قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَهْلَكَنْ What is your opinion? What if Allah was to punish me and everyone here? Who would save the kuffar from the punishment of Allah? Who can save? Right? Allah says in verse number 29, قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانِ Say, He is the most merciful. آمَنَّا بِهِ We believe in Him. So what do we do after hearing all of Surah Mulk? What, is, what are we supposed to do? What is our responsibility after reading Surah Mulk? Verse number 20, 29 is our responsibility. What is the outcome? What is the action plan of Surah Mulk? Which verse is it? Verse number 29. قُلْ هُوَ الرَّحْمَانُ آمَنَّا بِهِ Say, He is the most merciful. آمَنَّا بِهِ We believe in Him. وَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا And upon Him we have relied. فَسَتَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ هُوَ فِي ظَلَالِ مُبِينَ And you will come to know who it is that is in clear air. In the last verse, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ the, the, the last level, right? The, the, the highest level of Qudra of Allah. The greatest, you know, kind of like the, the punchline. This is the Qudra. This is the power of Allah. قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ مِنَ أَسْبَحَ مَاءُكُمْ غَوْرَىٰ Say, what is your opinion if your water was to become sunken into the earth? Allah took the water away from you. Allah took the water away from us. فَمَنْ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِمَاءٍ مَّعِينٍ Who could bring you flowing water again? Such a simple thing that we've taken for granted. Such a simple thing. You know, the human being, the, the greatest ingredient in the human being's body, what is it? The greatest component is water. Simple thing. Allah says, if we were to take water away from you, if the water was to sink into the earth and it's gone, who could bring you flowing water again? If water cannot be given but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what about everything else? What about the air we breathe? What about our eyes blinking? What about our nose breathing? What about our ears hearing? What about these senses? What about this hair? What about our intellect? What about these eyes? All of this. Who can give this to us other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is the lesson of Surah Mulk. The lesson of Surah Mulk is to submit ourselves to the will of Allah. And to every night before we go to sleep, Surah Mulk teaches us to make istighfar. What does Surah Mulk teach us? To repent to Allah. This is what Surah Mulk teaches us. Every night before you go to sleep, ask Allah for protection. Oh Allah, I am not able of this. Oh Allah, please forgive me. Every night before you go to sleep, Make intention to submit yourself to the one who has kingdom, the mulk. And make yourself, make an intention to yourself to submit yourself to the one who has qudra, the one who has the power. This is the lesson of Surah Mulk. Right? And that's what my teacher used to say, that whichever surah, and I'm going to end with this, as I started with this. Any surah in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a virtue for it. That virtue is actually within the meaning of that surah. Why is a person saved from the job by reading Surah Kahf? It's because that's what Surah Kahf teaches you, to not be materialistic. Why, does, why do we get the reward of reading one-third of the Qur'an by reading Surah Ikhlas? Because one-third of the Qur'an's message is Allah is one. What is one-third of the Qur'an's message? Allah is one. That's what, what one-third of the Qur'an is about. So, Qurwa Allah wa if you've understood that, that means you've understood one-third of the Qur'an. Why is Surah Mulk going to save you from the punishment of the grave? It's because someone who reads this, they have to be crazy not to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have to be crazy not to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, 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 for uh, what do you call this, refuge from his punishment. So we pray that Allah azza wa jal gives us all the tawfiq to act on what has been said. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us amongst those who understand Surah Mulk. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be amongst those who read Surah Mulk every night. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this gathering as a hujjah for us on the day of judgment to save us from the punishment of Allah on the day of judgment and to save us from the punishment of the grave. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك آخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى